Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Four men chosen by God to tell about the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. But why four? Why not five? Or even just one? Welcome to the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, gives us a hint at the answers to these questions when we explore the Gospel of Matthew in his sermon titled, Matthew, Written for the Religious Man. Before we jump into our study, though, we have just a few minutes to share some letters sent in by our fellow Bible bus passengers. The first one comes from Teaneck, New Jersey. My husband and I have been riding the Bible bus together every morning. When we miss the bus, which sometimes happens, we're grateful to catch it again on the Internet. Thank you, thank you for your broadcasts. We have grown closer to God and closer to each other because of it. And then here's a letter. This is from Adriana, who listens to our Spanish broadcast from her home in Mexico. It is a blessing the way God works. I used to watch TV until it was time to go to sleep. Then my TV broke and I felt lost. One night, I turned on the radio and one might say, the lights came on in my home for the first time. I have been listening to you ever since. I bless you from the bottom of my heart for this gift. And then finally, we have an email. This is from a listener named Ian who shares, Thank you for sharing that our emails are an encouragement to you because you are certainly a great encouragement to me. The mental picture of a Bible bus is a real inspiration as I have the vision of it going along in all weathers, both sunny and stormy. That really is a comfort to me as opposition and difficulties come my way, which they are at present. What's God doing in your life? Do you have a story to share with us? Ian's right. Your calls and your emails and letters, they're such an encouragement to us. We really do love hearing from you, so contact us today. Just call and leave a message on our listener testimony line at 1-800-65-BIBLE. You can also email us at biblebus at ttb.org or write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C 6B1. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is perfect and overcomes social and geographical and cultural boundaries. Thank you that you love us so much that you've gone to great lengths to reach us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now here's the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Our subject is Matthew, written for the religious man. The public has been subjected to to the news of one of the most brutal crimes in this century. The mass martyrs that the news media has labeled the Sharon Tate case. It's one of the most shocking and sensational crimes in this age of crime. A group of young people, some teenagers, Some barely out of their teens, even girls participated, committed in the most cold-blooded fashion, wholesale slaying from what looks like a passionless and senseless orgy of blood. This, I think, is the final product of a society that boasts of its new freedom and its new morality and that we need to get rid of the Judeo-Christian ethic, as they have called it. Nothing new, of course, uh, because this age has been duplicated many times before. This is what happens when depraved human nature is free to do its thing. These Antediluvians, way back at the very beginning, they engaged in great wickedness. 
evil, corruption, viciousness, vileness, and violence. Paul said there was going to come a generation that uh, he listed a catalog of many things, and among them was they would be without natural affection, and they would be despisers of those that are good. Looks like we've arrived, does it not? The most offensive and disgusting factor to me is that the leader of this group of young degenerates calls himself Jesus Christ. This blasphemous assumption reveals that he was a religious leader, that he was operating a depraved and disgusting religion. And there are many like that abroad in our Southland today. Two factors, I think, emerge right now in our contemporary culture. One is that the Lord Jesus Christ is still a controversial person. Nineteen hundred years ago, he asked the question, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they don't have the answer today. In that day, it was John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets. But they all came short. They didn't have the answer, and they don't have the answer today, but they're still talking about him. It reveals a second factor, that filth, depravity, corruption, degeneracy, and sex have become a religion again. And that's not new, because all of the pagan religions of the past were based on sex. The female principle is in the deities of all pagan religion. Religion has always been the greatest curse of mankind. If you doubt that, look at India today. They've got religion. Look at Africa today. Africa has religion. And the very interesting thing is, Los Angeles is filled with religion. But religion has been a curse to mankind. And religion always deals with externalities. It deals with rituals, with liturgy, with forms, with rules, with regulations, with ceremonies, with laws, with ordinances, with rites, and orgies and incantations. After all, God gave only one religion, and that's the Mosaic system. Christianity, and may I repeat it again, I'll repeat it several times before this series is through, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a person, and you either have that person or you don't have that person, and to have him is salvation, and that's not a religion. May I say to you, God did give the Mosaic system, and it was given only to the nation Israel. This nation represented religion in the day that Christ came to this earth, and Jerusalem was the religious center of the world. And as we indicated last week, there are four major divisions of the human family, and each gospel is slanted in the direction of each one of these segments. And the Gospel of Matthew is written primarily to the nation Israel, therefore written to religion, if you please. And it was written by an ex-tax gatherer to meet the need of his countrymen, because as a tax gatherer, he had a great need in that day, though he were a, a rich man. When he wrote about himself, he had very little to say in the Ninth chapter of Matthew, verse 9, he says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. That's Matthew. But Mark and Luke both tell us that uh, Matthew made him a great feast in his house and invited all of his friends in. 
My friend, if you have come to know Christ, you certainly want somebody else to know him. He invited all of his friends in. He apparently was a wealthy man. May I say to you, but he tells us practically nothing about himself because he's presenting another. Now, Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. It's the only New Testament book that was written in Hebrew. And you would say to me, preacher, what's your authority for that? Well, Papias, one of the early church fathers, and he was a bishop in Asia Minor, he lived toward the end of the first, uh, first century and into the second. He was evangelized by Philip and ba Bartholomew. They are the ones who preached the gospel that caused this man to turn to Christ. He became a disciple of John. He was an associate of Polycarp, the martyr, and of Justice of Jerusalem. And uh, he is the one that tells us that the Gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew. May I give an exact quotation from him? Matthew wrote the oracles of the Lord in the Hebrew tongue, and everyone interpreted them as he was able. Now, this is the language that the Jew would have accepted, and the only one. You will recall that when Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, the mob was ready to take him and stone him to death, and he was rescued and came to the steps of the palace there of the captain, and the mob still was milling about, ready to take him, and he began to speak to them in the Hebrew tongue. And it quieted them down just as the Lord had quieted the waves on the Sea of Galilee, and they listened to him. The Gospel of Matthew was first written in the Hebrew tongue for them. And after all, that's the language of religion. You remember what the Lord Jesus said to the woman at the well, Salvation is of the Jews. And Dr. Kurtz, the great German historian, has written, Judaism prepared salvation for mankind, and heathenism prepared mankind for salvation. And Dr. Gregory says, the world religion has been delivered to them. Isn't it amazing that the other religions of the world were always slanted to a particular group of people? But the gospel given to these people, and they were a small group in that day, is a gospel that is to go out to the very ends of the earth. That's something that ought to cause the critic to think twice today. Now, God had prepared these people over the long haul, 2,000 years even before Christ came. There was a man living down in Ur of the Chaldees in idolatry, for the whole world had gone into idolatry. And God called Abram and said, Leave this. Follow me. Come into the land, I'll show you. And God made certain covenants with that man. He promised him a land. He promised him a nation. And he promised that he'd be a blessing to the nations of the world. Because after the flood and then the Tower of Babel, God had to bid goodbye to the human family. But he said to them, I'll be back because I'm going to prepare salvation for the world. And so he prepared these people in their long history. Three dispersions were predicted. Also, it was predicted they would be regathered three times. Up to this morning, all three dispersions have taken place, but only two regathering. I disagree with the, that over yonder today, that present nation is the picture of the third regathering. You haven't read the Old Testament if you come to that conclusion, my beloved, because those prophecies concerning that third regathering have not been fulfilled. 
God took these people first, drew them aside from the stream of humanity, segregated them, put them in a place where he could school them and train them. And then he scattered them throughout the world for a purpose. There's purpose in what our God does. The first one took place at the time of Jacob and his family. Seventy souls went down under Jacob. They came out probably a million and a half. Jacob went down to Egypt at God's direction. God said to this man, go on down there. And there in the brickyards, God forged in the fires of slavery these people into a nation. Then he took them out into the wilderness, and there he gave them the Mosaic system, a religion. And then he kept them in that wilderness 40 years to train them and give them the experience of the 40 years with the law. And then at the end of it, Moses wrote Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is not a repetition of the law, but it's the interpretation of the law with 40 years' experience. And God gave to them for the ancient world the greatest doctrinal statement that most theologians say is the greatest doctrinal statement in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Or let me translate it a little different. Jehovah, your Elohim. Elohim is plural. The Hebrew has a dual. It, that's not used. And when the plural is used above three of the numbers given here, no number, but it's plural. May I translate like this? Jehovah, our triune God is one Jehovah. That's what God was saying. And he said it through these people. And he said it in a world of polytheism. And he said to them, Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. And these people bore that witness. They had an influence. Have you ever wondered about the Greeks and their tremendous civilization? When Homer was singing and writing about the gods on Mount Olympus and the wars at Troy and Helen of Troy, at that same time, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, was singing praises to his God. And it's recognized today that they influenced the Greeks. And it caused many intelligent Greeks to repudiate the gods on Mount Olympus and say there's only one God. Socrates wrote that way. Plato wrote that way. And out yonder in the Far East, there arose after the Babylonian captivity Zoroastrianism, modern Parsiism. Out of the ancient world, they testified to the oneness of God. Where did they get it? They got it from these people. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, your triune God, our triune God is one Jehovah. Nothing greater than that, my friend. And then they went into Babylonian captivity because they did go into idolatry in spite of what God had said. And 70 years they were down yonder in the land of Babylon. And by the decree of Cyrus, they were returned. And during this period, Jesus was born. Then our Lord said, after his rejection, your house is left under you desolate. Not one stone will be left upon another here. They said, when? The disciples did. He said, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, and in 70 A.D. Titus the Roman came and surrounded that city, he, he breached the wall, and his hordes marched in, and there has never been a slaughter that's quite compared to that. May I say to you that at that time these people were scattered throughout the world and they took the synagogue to every corner of the empire. 
And that synagogue became the springboard by which Paul and the other apostles came in every city, preached the gospel, and then they were thrown out and the Gentiles heard. But they've made a rich contribution to the history of this world. Pharaoh in Egypt at the time of his greatest crisis had as a prime minister Joseph, and it's a good thing that he did. Daniel was prime minister to the ruler, rulers of two of the great world empires, influenced them and led them to a knowledge of God, Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. And then there came a Persian ruler. He had a Jewish consort by the name of Esther. He had a prime minister by the name of Mordecai. And he had a secretary of state by the name of Nehemiah. And that was another critical moment in the history of the world when the power did pass from the east to the west. And it was determined that the west would prevail. In the day when Christ came this God-given religion had deteriorated into a liturgy of laws and empty ritual where they would tie the little row of anise and cumin, that which would be a condiment. The scribes and Pharisees, the religious rulers, had reduced it to nothing in the world but a form, and our Lord said to them, it's the letter of the law you pay attention to, you've missed the spirit of it, Altogether, and I'm afraid that fundamentalism may be doing that today also. One thing to say you believe this is the Word of God, it's another thing to know it and let it speak to your heart. One thing to carry a Bible under your arm, it's another thing to get a little of it in your head. You see, fundamentalism can reduce it to a little form and ceremony. We think today, many of us, that if we carry a Bible, if we learn a certain vocabulary and act very pious on Sunday, we got it made. May I say to you, that's the thing our Lord condemned the Pharisees and scribes for. The people in our Lord's day, for the most part, were ignorant of the Scripture. They only knew what the scribes and Pharisees gave them. They had no Bible of their own. The Orthodox Jew of that day, and they were, they were in the majority, they would not accept anything that did not conform to the law and the prophets. It had to follow the letter of the law. Matthew wrote to show that Jesus was the Messiah, that he fulfilled the letter of the law and the prophets in his coming to this earth. He said he was going to initiate a kingdom on earth, but it must conform to the intent of the Old Testament. Not just an outward form, but an inward chain. And I studied under amillennialists. I went to an amillennial seminary, and I do wish the amillennialists would understand what our Lord really meant when he says the kingdom is within. Of course it's within. That's where it has to begin. You don't rub it on the outside like uh, lotion or rubbing alcohol. It's something that has to begin in the heart. And Matthew makes it very clear. And that the kingdom is to be peopled with a people who've been changed from within. They must have a capacity for God. But Messiah must die to make that possible. That man that came to Jesus that night, he was a religious leader, and he came to talk about the kingdom. Our Lord says, you can't see the kingdom of God except you must be born again. You must be born again. But he also said, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth on him might not perish, but have everlasting life. He must die to make the kingdom possible. He must die to bring the church into being. 
Matthew does not deal with that. The matter of the church. He merely gives that prediction, our Lord said, I will build my church. And so the Gospel of Matthew, very briefly, tells about the birth of Jesus. And it opens with these majestic words, and I'm afraid they're meaningless when you just put a New Testament in the hands of anybody. And they begin with Matthew. That genealogy is pretty discouraging, friends. But it's a wonderful genealogy. And it opens in these majestic words. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That was never challenged. That's who he is. That's written for the Jew, he said. Sure, he's the son of Abraham. If he's the son of David, I'll listen. He's the son of Abraham. And then the genealogy is given to explain why Joseph could not be the father. And actually, the the value of the virgin of the genealogy is not really how could he be born of a virgin, but how could he be born any other way? <laughs> because Matthew makes it clear that Jeconias is in that line. Back in Jeremiah, there had been a curse pronounced upon that line. And no one in that line could sit on the throne of David. How can Joseph have one? He can't. But he can be the husband of Mary, who's also in the line of David through another route, through Nathan, and through, by being her husband, he can give to Jesus the royal rights, the legal rights to the throne of David. Israel must know that. And Matthew wrote for that reason. He gives four prophecies. That looked to me, if you go back and read them, you'd have as much trouble as the post millennialists used to have with prophets. If you'd lived in that day, you would have said, how in the world can Messiah, when he comes, how can he be born in Bethlehem? Why are the women weeping, mothers weeping in Ramah? Why does he call him out of Egypt, and how can he call him out if he's born in Bethlehem? And of all things, he's to be brought up in Nazareth to be called a Nazarene. How can it be? Matthew gives all the prophecies. He says that Micah said he'll be born in Bethlehem. He was. He said that Jeremiah said there'd be weeping yonder in Ramah. There was, ten miles north of Jerusalem. And Bethlehem, ten miles south. Old Herod drew a circle, says we'll kill everybody in the circle. It reached north. He did call him out of Egypt, as Hosea says, and Isaiah said he'd be called a Nazarene. And not only that, but Daniel, and I won't go into it, that marvelous prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel gives the time that Messiah would be cut off. This nation should have been sitting on the curbstone in Jerusalem, waiting for the triumphal entry to come by, to accept and receive it. Had they accepted their word, really accepted the spirit of it, and believed it with all their heart. Why, it had even predicted the star. Old Balaam said, a star will rise out of Judah. And these wise men came out of the east where Balaam had been. They said, we've seen his star, king of the Jews. We've come to worship him. And it was Isaiah that made it very clear that Gentiles were going to be present. Will you listen? Isaiah in chapter 11, verse 10, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Oh, how accurate Isaiah is. Not a root of David. Why didn't he say David? He says... Jesse, because by this time, the line of David are back as peasants as Jesse was, no longer king. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glory. 
And we are told again that he'll be a light unto the Gentiles in the 60th chapter. May I say to you, the wise man came out of the east. And John the Baptist, Matthew says, came according to the prophecy of Malachi when he said, I'll send my messenger before me. And out yonder in the wilderness there went out this message. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when our Lord came, he picked up that message. And then the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew gives it as no other gospel writer. Why? It's given for a people under law. May I say to you, it's given for people who have a religion. Have you ever noticed that the liberal always goes to this? I've talked to any number of men and women who said to me, the Sermon on the Mount is my religion. You better change it, friend, unless you're heathen. I haven't found anybody yet that's keeping. And I say to you, we don't need religion. We need Christ today. We need a Savior. And the Sermon on the Mount is religion. And he gave the ethic, don't despise the Sermon on the Mount. Just realize that you don't keep it and be honest. But he also gave the dynamic in, Ma in Matthew after that. Matthew's not attempting to give you a chronological life of Christ. He clusters together a group of miracles our Lord performed to show you that the one who gave the ethic on top of the mountain had the power to execute it down below. He is the one that Matthew is presenting. And then he shows that the Sermon on the Mount deals with the outside again. Why? Because the, the people have already been dealt with on the inside. You have to be changed from within. And after three years of ministry, our Lord took these men who'd been with him three years up to Caesarea Philippi, and he said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, there's all kinds of reports going around. They've been going around for 1,900 years. Then he said, whom do you think I? That's the question he asked you. And Simon Peter said what any Jew in that day must have said who came to know him. Thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you but my Father which is in heaven. And at that time, he mentions the church for the first time. That is his immediate program now. But wait just a minute. He had something else now to give them that was new. After Simon Peter gave that magnificent answer, our Lord says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And Simon Peter wasn't ready for that one. And a lot of people today that have religion are not ready for it either. Simon Peter had a religion, but he's not ready for this. He believed the Old Testament, but he's not ready for this one. Or be it from thee, Lord. How wrong was he? He's so wrong that our Lord says, Get thee behind me, Satan. That type of talk is satanic. And then Dr. Luke says, He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And Matthew, for the benefit of these people, says five times on the way to Jerusalem, He said, The Son of Man is going to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. 
I'm going to Jerusalem to die. And again and again he gave that to them. You see, at the very beginning of his ministry, he never told these disciples about his death. You see now why they weren't ready. And he came to Jerusalem for that last time. Our Lord denounced, he denounced the religious rulers as no one has ever been denounced. Will you listen to him? Matthew 23. I'd like to turn there now to verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. The word hypocrite was the word used over in Athens for an actor. It's somebody playing a part. Crino means to answer. Cupo means to answer back. And an actor is one. Somebody gives him a line and a cue, and he answers back. Hypocrite was an actor. Somebody playing a part. And our Lord said to them, you're just act in religion. A lot of people play church. It's fun. <laughs> they love it. You know, you can come and you can just do so many things in the church. But you cannot be saved. You can just be acting. Listen to him. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weighter matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. They argue about <laughs> little things. Dr. McGee, do you think a Christian could smoke a cigarette? Why don't you grow up? Faith and mercy and judgment. What about your life? You don't smoke. But what about your life? Is it real to you today? Are you just playing a part? Listen to him. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. That's a good one. I'd been there to laugh. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup of a platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. And that sums it all up. Outside, that's religion. Inside is Christianity. And when you get the inside clean, the outside will take care of itself. And then he gave to them, and I have to drop back to pick this up. In the 21st chapter, will you listen to him? Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. They rejected him, but he will become the head of the corner. He'll yet rule on this earth. He's still the Savior of the world. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Now, you're going to have to do with Jesus Christ someday. Every person will. Saved or lost, you'll stand before him. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, the nation Israel, given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And I think he's getting ready to take it away from us, too. And whosoever shall fall on the, this stone, who is that stone? It's Christ. Fall upon him for salvation. Come in your weakness and in your sin and accept him. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. There is the great white throne, and he is the one there.
that must judge you if you reject him. Either the stone is where you can fall, your own free volition, or else he'll come in judgment. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they took him for a prophet. Then he gave a commission, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And I think as those disciples heard him say that that day on the Mount of Olives, that they went back to Isaiah and they heard Isaiah as he talked about my servant. He shall be a light to the Gentiles. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. A gospel now that reaches inside and transforms individuals who will trust Jesus Christ. Our contemporary cultures rejected him in more ways than one. I was reading just last night in a magazine where five of the most popular records today by the five most popular singers has to do with, I love me, I'm just wild about myself. And that we're moving now into an, an era where no longer will there be love songs talking about the girl or the boy. But I love me. This generation really has become interested in itself. I've got to do my thing. I am, I got to have freedom. Oh, I'm somebody. You must hear from me. God said, won't you take your rightful place as a sinner? See that you have a great need and that you're not really as wonderful as you think you are. And you can rub it on the outside, but it's vanishing cream. It won't help you. You need a Savior. I read this little jingle. In walking by a mirror fast, I vaguely wondered whom I passed. I backed up several steps to see, and what a shock, the wreck was me. Are you willing to see yourself as that wreck? Or do you preen yourself today, proud today? May God help us in this hour to see that we have lost sinners who need a Savior. Matthew wrote to a religious people. They had religion, but they didn't have Christ. If you'd like to know more about our wonderful Savior, then visit us at ttb.org and click on How Can I Know God? There you'll find several free resources that we've gathered just for you. And for those of you who know the Savior but you want to take your study of God's Word deeper, then visit our website at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. There's more from Dr. McGee this week as our daily study of Matthew continues, so I hope that you'll join us. Now, the sermon, Matthew, Written for the Religious Man, is available on an individual CD or as part of our audio series titled, Why Four Gospels? Available on CD or MP3 disc. You can also read it by downloading the free e-booklet by the same title when you visit ttb.org. I'm Steve Schwetz, praying that God will fill you with his grace, mercy, and peace until we meet again. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.